Ocean currents are driven by a range of sources, the wind, tides, changes in water density, and the rotation of the earth. The topography of the ocean floor and the shoreline modifies those motions, causing currents to speed up, slow down, or change direction. Ocean currents fall into two main categories, surface currents and deep ocean currents. Surface currents control the motion of the top 10% of the ocean's water, while deep ocean currents mobilize the other 90%. Though they have different causes, surface and deep ocean currents influence each other in an intricate dance that keeps the entire ocean moving. Near the shore, surface currents are driven by both the wind and tides, which draw water back and forth as the water level falls and rises. Meanwhile, in the open ocean, wind is the major force behind surface currents. As wind blows over the ocean, it drags the top layers of water along with it. That moving water pulls on the layers underneath, and those pull on the ones beneath them. As early as 8000 BCE, the earliest Neolithic farmers living in the Fertile Crescent began a legacy of cheesemaking almost as old as civilization itself. The rise of agriculture led to domesticated sheep and goats, which ancient farmers harvested for milk. But when left in warm conditions for several hours, that fresh milk began to sour. Its lactic acids caused proteins to coagulate, binding into soft clumps. Upon discovering this strange transformation, the farmers drained the remaining liquid, later named whey, and found the yellowish globs could be eaten fresh as a soft, spreadable meal. These clumps, or curds, became the building blocks of cheese, which would eventually be aged, pressed, ripened, and whizzed into a diverse cornucopia of dairy delights. The discovery of cheese gave Neolithic people an enormous survival advantage. Milk was rich with essential proteins, fats, and minerals, but it also contained high quantities of lactose, a sugar which is difficult to process for many ancient and modern stomachs. Cheese, however, could provide all of milk's advantages with much less lactose. And since it could be preserved and stockpiled, these essential nutrients could be eaten throughout scarce famines and long winters. The elephant boasts the largest brain of any land mammal, as well as an impressive encephalization quotient. This is the size of the brain relative to what we'd expect for an animal's body size, and the elephant's EQ is nearly as high as a chimpanzee's. And despite the distant relation, convergent evolution has made it remarkably similar to the human brain, with as many neurons and synapses and a highly developed hippocampus and cerebral cortex. It is the hippocampus, strongly associated with emotion, that aids recollection by encoding important experiences into long TRM memories. The ability to distinguish this importance makes elephant memory a complex and adaptable faculty beyond rote memorization. It's what allows elephants who survived a drought in their youth to recognize its warning signs in adulthood, which is why clans with older matriarchs have higher survival rates. Unfortunately, it's also what makes elephants one of the few non-human animals to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. 
The cerebral cortex, on the other hand, enables problem solving, which elephants display in many creative ways. They also tackle problems cooperatively, sometimes even outwitting the researchers and manipulating their partners. And they've grasped basic arithmetic, keeping track of the relative amounts of fruit in two baskets after multiple changes. Many patients acquire the allergy label as children when a rash appears after they're treated for an infection with penicillin or closely related drugs. The rash is often blamed on penicillin, while the more likely culprit is the original infection or a reaction between the infection and the antibiotic. However, genuine penicillin allergies, where our immune systems mistake penicillin for an attacker, do occur rarely and can be very dangerous. So if you think you're allergic, but don't know for sure, your best bet is to visit an allergist. They'll complete an evaluation that'll confirm whether or not you have the allergy. Even if you do have a penicillin allergy, your immune cells that react to the drug may lose their ability to recognize it. In fact, about 80% of people who are allergic to penicillin outgrow their allergy within 10 years. This is great news for people who currently identify as allergic to penicillin, the drug may one day save their lives, as it has done for so many others. Although modern money laundering methods vary greatly, most share three basic steps, placement, layering, and integration. Placement is where illegally obtained money is converted into assets that seem legitimate. That's often done by depositing funds into a bank account registered to an anonymous corporation or a professional middleman. This step is where criminals are often most vulnerable to detection since they introduce massive wealth into the financial system seemingly out of nowhere. The second step, layering, involves using multiple transactions to further distance the funds from their origin. This can take the FORM of transfers between multiple accounts, or the purchase of tradable property like expensive cars, artwork, and real estate. Casinos, where large sums of money change hands every second, are also popular venues for layering. A money launderer may have their gambling balance made available at a casino chain's locations in other countries, or work with employees to rig games. The last step, integration, allows clean money to re-enter the mainstream economy and to benefit the original criminal. They might invest it into a legal business claiming payment by producing fake invoices, or even start a bogus charity, placing themselves on the board of directors with an exorbitant salary.
nobody knows exactly when humans began to create fermented beverages. The earliest known evidence comes from 7000 BC in China, where residue in clay pots has revealed that people were making an alcoholic beverage from fermented rice, millet, grapes, and honey. Within a few thousand years, cultures all over the world were fermenting their own drinks. Ancient Mesopotamians and Egyptians made beer throughout the year from stored cereal grains. This beer was available to all social classes, and workers even received it in their daily rations. They also made wine, but because the climate wasn't ideal for growing grapes, it was a rare and expensive delicacy. By contrast, in Greece and Rome, where grapes grew more easily, wine was as readily available as beer was in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Because yeasts will ferment basically any plant sugars, ancient peoples made alcohol from whatever crops and plants grew where they lived. In South America, people made chicha from grains, sometimes adding hallucinogenic herbs. In what's now Mexico, pulque, made from cactus sap, was the drink of choice, while East Africans made banana and palm beer. And in the area that's now Japan, people made sake. Drug interactions happen when the combination of a drug with another substance causes different effects than either would individually. Foods, herbal supplements, legal drugs, and illicit substances can all cause drug interactions. Most drug interactions fall into two categories. Some take place when two substances' effects influence each other directly. In other cases, one substance affects how the body processes another, like how it is absorbed, metabolized, or transported around the body. Blood thinners and aspirin, for example, have similar effects that become dangerous when combined. Both prevent blood clots from forming, blood thinners, by preventing the formation of the clotting factors that hold clots together, and aspirin by preventing blood cells from clumping into groups that become clots. Individually, these effects are usually safe, but taken together, they can prevent blood clotting to a dangerous extent possibly causing internal bleeding. While blood thinners and aspirin are generally harmless when taken individually, interactions where one substance exacerbates the effects of another can also take place between drugs that are independently harmful. Nearly 9,000 years ago, corn, also called maize, was first domesticated from Tiacinti, a grass native to Mesoamerica. Tiacinti's rock-hard seeds were barely edible, but its fibrous husk could be turned into a versatile material. Over the next 4,700 years, farmers bred the plant into a staple crop, with larger cobs and edible kernels. As maize spread throughout the Americas, it took on an important role with multiple indigenous societies revering a corn mother as the goddess who created agriculture. When Europeans first arrived in America, they shunned the strange plant. Many even believed it was the source of physical and cultural differences between them and the Mesoamericans. However, their attempts to cultivate European crops in American soil quickly failed, 
and the settlers were forced to expand their diet. Finding the crop to their taste, maize soon crossed the Atlantic, where its ability to grow in diverse climates made it a popular grain in many European countries. But the newly established United States was still the corn capital of the world. We may think of nature as being unconnected to our urban spaces, but trees have always been an essential part of successful cities. Trees act like a natural sponge, absorbing stormwater runoff before releasing it back into the atmosphere. The webs of their roots protect against mudslides while allowing soil to retain water and filter out toxins. Roots help prevent floods while reducing the need for storm drains and water treatment plants. Their porous leaves purify the air by trapping carbon and other pollutants, making them essential in the fight against climate change. Humanity has been uncovering these arboreal benefits for centuries. But trees aren't just crucial to the health of a city's infrastructure, they play a vital role in the health of its citizens as well. In the 1870s, Manhattan had few trees outside the island's parks. Without trees to provide shade, buildings absorbed up to nine times more solar radiation during deadly summer heat waves. Combined with the period's poor sanitation standards, the oppressive heat made the city a breeding ground for bacteria like cholera. If you have an old phone, you might want to consider your options before throwing it away. To minimize waste, you could donate it to a charity for reuse, take it to an e-waste recycling facility, or look for a company that refurbishes old models. However, even recycling companies need our scrutiny. Just as the production of smartphones comes with social and environmental problems, dismantling them does too. E-waste is sometimes intentionally exported to countries where labor is cheap, but working conditions are poor. Vast workforces, often made up of women and children, may be underpaid, lack the training to safely disassemble phones, and be exposed to elements like lead and mercury, which can permanently damage their nervous systems. Phone waste can also end up in huge dump sites, leaching toxic chemicals into the soil and water, mirroring the problems of the mines where the elements originated. A phone is much more than it appears to be on the surface. It's an assemblage of elements from multiple countries, linked to impacts that are unfolding on a global scale. So, until someone invents a completely sustainable smartphone, we'll need to come to terms with how this technology affects widespread places and people.
our memories are sometimes unreliable. And though we still don't know precisely what causes this fallibility on a neurological level, research has highlighted some of the most common ways our memories diverge from what actually happened. The MAL study highlights how we can incorporate information from outside sources, like other people or the news, into our personal recollections without realizing it. This kind of suggestibility is just one influence on our memories. Take another study, in which researchers briefly showed a random collection of photographs to a group of participants, including images of a university campus none of them had ever visited. When shown the images three weeks later, a majority of participants said that they had probably or definitely visited the campus in the past. The participants misattributed information from one context, an image they'd seen, onto another, a memory of something they believed they actually experienced. In another experiment, people were shown an image of a magnifying glass and then told to imagine a lollipop. They frequently recalled that they saw the magnifying glass and the lollipop. They struggled to link the objects to the correct context, whether they actually saw them or simply imagined them. The group of artists who are considered abstract expressionists includes Barnett Newman with his existential zips, Willem de Kooning, famous for his travestied women, Helen Frankenthaler, who created soak stains, and others. But perhaps the most famous, influential, and head-scratching one was Jackson Pollock. Most of his paintings are immediately recognizable. They feature tangled messes of lines of paint bouncing around in every direction on the canvas. And sure, these fields of chaos are big and impressive, but what's so great about them, didn't he just jerk the paint at random? Can't anyone do that? Well, the answer to these questions is both yes and no. While Pollock implemented a technique anyone is technically capable of, regardless of artistic training, only he could have made his paintings. This paradox relates to his work's roots in the surrealist automatic drawings of André Masson and others. These surrealists supposedly drew directly from the unconscious to reveal truths hidden within their minds. Occasionally, instead of picturing something and then drawing it, they let their hands move automatically and would later tease out familiar figures that appeared in the scribbles. A new evidence-based way to better remember what you've learned is through spaced repetition, or spacing out your learning and practice of new knowledge or skills. Although this might seem novel, this is hardly a new concept. It was first described in 1885 by a German psychologist named Hermann Ebbinghaus. Here's how it works. Say you plot your retention, or how much you remember of something, versus time. Now you learn that something on day zero. Without reviewing it. The forgetting curve will look like an exponentially decaying curve, which is kind of scary. If you review, or better yet actively retrieve, the material at increasingly spaced intervals after learning it, then the forgetting curve starts to flatten out and you'll get a lot better longer-term retention. Now, the goal here is to review the material at the right time, 
It turns out that the best time to revisit information that you are trying to learn is right around the time you would naturally forget it. Since forgetting typically follows this exponential curve, the trick becomes timing your study sessions around it. Practically, this means having more widely spaced intervals between study times for the material that you are more familiar with and shorter intervals between study sessions for material that you are less familiar with. Montessori education is based on the principles developed by Maria Montessori, who opened her first school for children of low-income workers in an apartment building in Rome in 1907. The school was called Casa dei Bambini, Home for Children. This first casa was furnished with a teacher's table, a stove, a blackboard, some chairs, group tables for the children, and a cabinet filled with materials that Montessori developed in her earlier career when she researched how to teach kids who experience some form of mental disability. Maria Montessori created the materials after she realized that students seemed to understand complex concepts better when they engaged all their senses. Activities at this first school included personal care, such as dressing and undressing, care of the environment like sweeping, dusting, and gardening. Otherwise, they were free to move around and play with the materials. Montessori did not teach herself, but instead oversaw the classroom work of her teachers. Montessori observed that children showed episodes of deep concentration and multiple repetitions of the same activity. Given free choice, kids showed more interest in practical activities and the materials than normal toys, sweets, or other rewards. Over time, spontaneous self-discipline emerged. Montessori concluded that working independently, children seem to reach new levels of autonomy and become self-motivated learners. She began to see the role of the teacher as a facilitator of young human beings who are free to move and act within the limits of a prepared environment. The goal, to grow children to become independent and responsible adults who share a love for learning. English philosopher John Locke gives us a pretty standard way to map out boundaries of intuition. So that's where we'll start. Locke contrasts intuition to sensory perception on one side and to demonstration on the other. Sensory perception, he notices, is always about particular things. You see this pizza in front of you right now. Maybe you see that this pizza is round. But we aren't restricted to making judgments about particular things. When we judge that no round things are square, we aren't just thinking about that particular pizza, but about a more general and abstract truth. Judging that circles are different from squares, according to Locke, is intuitive. And at least in this kind of case where Locke thinks we're recognizing features of our ideas, intuition is a perfectly good source of knowledge. We know that no round things are square through intuition. Locke also draws a contrast between intuition and demonstration. Intuition can tell us directly that a circle is not a triangle. But when we get to more complex questions, we need to use demonstration or explicit reasoning. So for example, 
we can figure out that the interior angles of a triangle add up to two right angles, but we have to go through a series of steps to gain this knowledge. And that's demonstration. Demonstration requires conscious stages. Intuition is immediate. Locke notices that intuition and demonstration are connected, however. Each individual step in a chain of demonstrative reasoning is, or at least should be, intuitive. Contemporary thinkers still draw a similar distinction using a variety of labels for During the time when the church controlled what people could believe, and the kings ruled over what people ought to own, John Locke, an English doctor, popularized three ideas that changed society and parenting forever. First, people keep fighting over their beliefs, because nobody can actually know which one is true. To solve this problem, everyone should have freedom of thought and the right to choose their own religion. Second, kings can't just do as they please because people have natural rights to liberty, property, and life, and hence need to be asked for permission. Third, parents should avoid punishing their children, since the use of emotions to make them behave well can make them sensationalist. Instead, they should allow their children to be guided by thoughts. Locke's idea on religion and democracy became the foundation of most liberal societies. His thoughts on education, however, may have been even more influential. Locke understood that most people doubt new ideas, without any other apparent reason than them being uncommon. However, teaching children how to think rationally and all for themselves works. Education is therefore the key to freeing society from political and psychological tyranny. And his book, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, became a parenting guide to that world. The idea is that you experience awe in situations where it's important to be acquiring information that you can use later. It makes sense, if something is awe-inspiring because it doesn't fit with your understanding of the world, that's probably something that you should know more about if you want to survive. The feeling of awe directs your attention away from yourself and toward your environment, so you can acquire more information about this new, possibly life-changing thing, whether it's positive or negative. So. We might have given us a social advantage or an intellectual advantage, or maybe some combination of both. But no matter why the emotion evolved, we know that it's incredibly powerful, to the point that it can, like, totally hack your brain and body. For one thing, it can improve your physical health. It's been linked to lower levels of inflammation, which plays a role in all sorts of illnesses. Awe can also change your perception of what's causing events to unfold. Studies have found that it makes people more likely to interpret a series of events as the consequence of something intentional, as opposed to random chance. It's all part of the search for an explanation for something your brain is struggling to comprehend, which could help us explain why religion is a thing.
M. Fundamentally, the blackmailer is entitled. They believe that others are responsible for their feelings. They believe others must act in a way that makes them feel good, rather than taking responsibility for their own feelings. S. Oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. What about the person who lets themselves be blackmailed? Why do they allow that? M. The blackmailer refuses to take responsibility for their own feelings, but the blackmailee is the exact opposite, they take responsibility for feelings that aren't their own, while the blackmailer wants everyone around them to act a certain way, the blackmailee wants everyone to feel a certain way. While the blackmailer feels entitled, the blackmailee feels like they owe a debt. While the blackmailer passes judgments, the blackmailee is always looking to be positively judged. They take the judgments of other people very seriously. If someone says to them, you're a very selfish person, they believe it immediately. They think, am I selfish? I must be selfish. Why would someone say that if I wasn't? Oh God, I'm such a bad person. I need to fix this right now. While the blackmailer wants everyone to serve them, the blackmailee wants to serve everyone. They want to be liked and approved by everyone and they'll do just about anything to get it. While the blackmailer believes what they say is the truth, the blackmailee believes that what others say about them is the truth. And while the blackmailer's mind is dominated by taking, the blackmailee's mind is dominated by giving. When we fall in love, we tend to fall in love with somebody who wouldn't normally be considered compatible with us, because their personality traits are opposite to ours. This allows us to fit together like pieces of a puzzle. This person's good traits compensate for our bad ones, and vice versa. When we look back on it, we often wonder how we could have fallen in love with somebody who was so different from ourselves. But nature intended for us to fall in love and it made sure we would by having our brains release what we call feel-good hormones including oxytocin, phenylethylamine, serotonin, and dopamine. These hormones give aid to a biochemical process that rids us of stressors and fills us with infatuation. This is why it's so hard for us to recognize our partner's flaws. These hormones hide our flaws and encourage us to do whatever we can to keep the romance alive. While we aren't actually lying to our partners, we're wearing a mask of adoration. Taking off this mask and revealing who we really are may influence our partner to leave, so we keep it on. Knowing this, in order to avoid any major confrontations and confusion with your partner, you can work on bringing up somewhat difficult topics with them, such as whether or not you both want children or wish to be married. A massive forest provides a whole lot of fuel, so unless we want our national parks to become heaps of ash, there are some blazes that we need to shut down as quickly as they start. Dumping crazy amounts of water on a forest fire is one pretty effective approach. Water does a couple big things. First, water interferes with that combustion reaction because as it vaporizes it creates a layer of water vapor that separates the fire's fuel from the atmospheric oxygen that it needs to keep going. Second, the water cools the fuel, 
which slows and ultimately extinguishes the reaction. During a forest fire, firefighters work quickly to put out anything ablaze, including embers, which can fly around and spread the fire. They spray water from the ground and sky, refilling tanks at nearby water sources like lakes, rivers, or even your family's pool. At the same time crews are creating a fire break, which is exactly what it sounds like, a break between the fire and its fuel. But dumping water and cutting down forest often isn't enough. So, here's where that bright red stuff comes in. It's a long-term fire retardant, which means it can be sprayed on an area and, unless it gets washed away by a rainstorm, it will stick around for months. It's made of 85% water, 10% fertilizer, and 5% other stuff like clay and gum thickeners that help keep it together so that it makes to the ground from the plane. We all get afraid and feel fear. Seeing a spider, a loud noise, or a creak on floorboard late at night can strike fear suddenly right through our bodies. The feeling of fear can make your heart race, breath quicken, scream, sweat, pupils dilate, freeze you in place, and can even cause involuntary urination. These are all stress reactions caused by our limbic system, a chain reaction in areas of the brain that work together to control a built in fight or flight response. We have this built into us to help us react to and survive threats. If not for fear, we would most likely not have survived as a species. Lots of people actually seek out fear, enjoying being and feeling scared. Watching horror films, playing scary games, or even going on a roller coaster. When our fight or flight response is triggered, we release chemicals, which are similar to that of when we are excited or happy. When we trigger this in what we perceive as a safe environment, it is thought that we can then enjoy being scared and the chemicals running around our body that are akin to high arousal states. Scientists use a technique known as psychomotor vigilance tasks or PVTs to understand the impact of sleep deprivation on humans in studies. Simply put, it's a reaction test, a red button randomly turns green and people have to push it as fast as possible. Not so surprisingly, those who get 8 hours of sleep over a 2-week period show very few lapses in attention and no cognitive declines. But those groups that receive either 6 or 4 hours of sleep see declining PVT results on almost a daily basis for the entire two-week period. Of course, the 4-hour group performs the worst. But these results don't just show a loss of concentration, they show full lapses and awareness called microsleeps. In other words, their brains aren't just slower but shutting off for moments at a time. When looking at the results deeper, Scientists concluded that getting 6 hours of sleep for 10 days in a row was the same as not sleeping for 24 hours straight. That's the same cognitive decline as being legally drunk. And if you get 4 hours of sleep for 11 days, it's like you haven't slept for 48 hours straight.
But if not trying to escape, and trying too hard, are both bad choices, then what are you supposed to do if you get stuck in quicksand? The trick is to stay calm. First, get rid of any heavy items that you're wearing or carrying, as they'll only drag you deeper. Then, try to lean as far back as you can to create more space for yourself. Water will come in and fill the gaps you create, which will make it easier for you to move and pull your body towards the surface. If you can, grab a stick and wedge it underneath your back, this will help to increase your leverage. Hopefully, you'll get help from emergency services. But if not, you can use these tips to get out on your own. It will be a long and exhausting process since, just to free your foot from a puddle of quicksand, moving at a rate of 1 cm per second, it would require the same amount of force as it does to lift a small car. And once you're free, you'll probably be in a lot of pain. With all that pressure from the densely packed sand, you might emerge in the quicksand with permanent nerve damage, or without a leg. If you do manage to come out in one piece, well, maybe tread a little more carefully in the future. But don't let this one sucky experience keep you from another adventure. Put your best foot forward and take a walk on the wild side. Here are five steps to develop a strong research question. Step 1. Choose a broad topic. Go with a topic that sparks your interest, since you'll be spending quite some time with it. For me, I'm thinking maybe something about social media. Step 2. Do some preliminary reading about the topic. Okay, so I've read a lot of newspaper writing about how social media negatively impacts high school students' academic performances. And they also happen to be one of the most active age groups on social media. Step 3. Narrow down to a specific niche. This way, you can make sure the research is within a feasible scope instead of something too broad to achieve in a given time frame. Since academic performance is too broad, let me narrow it down to attention span. Step 4. Identify a research problem. So we have already established that adolescents are one of the most active age groups on social media platforms. But only a scarce amount of research has been done on the effect of social media on the younger generation's attention span. So this will be my research problem. Step 5. Write your research question. Turning your research problem into a question, and it sounds something like, what effect does daily use of Twitter have on the attention span of people in the age group of 16 to 20? Since this is descriptive research, the research question is also descriptive. But there are also other kinds of research questions, it all depends on the type of research you'll do. For example, comparative research, descriptive research, or correlational research. Essentially when the brain sees something that's novel, it has to burn more energy to represent it because it wasn't expecting that. This feeling that things are going in slow motion is a trick of memory. In other words, when you're in an emergency situation, a part of the brain called the amygdala comes online, this is your emergency control center, it lays down memories on what amounts to a secondary memory track, these are very dense memories. 
and you're noticing everything around you and writing it all down. So when the brain reads that back out, there's such a density of memory there that the brain's only conclusion is that must have taken a long time. And I think this offers an explanation for why people think that time seems to speed up as they grow older. And it's because when you're a child, everything's new to you. You're figuring out the rules of the world, you're writing down a lot of memory, and so when you look back at the end of a year, you have a lot of memory of what you've learned. But when you're much older and you look back at the end of the year, you're probably doing approximately the same stuff you've been doing for the X number of previous years. And so it seems like the year just went by in a flash. Why do we snore? Is there a bigger issue? Well, it's quite simple really. People snore when they are having a really boring dream. Or when I'm doing my stand-up routine. C. Lights out. I. I'm still working on the jokes. But for real, Mayo Clinic defines snoring as the hoarse or harsh sound that occurs when airflow passes relaxed tissues in your throat, causing the tissues to vibrate as you breathe. People can snore due to a variety of reasons. Allergies or a cold might do it, as well as alcohol consumption or sleep deprivation. A person's weight could also play a factor. Even just the anatomy of your mouth and sinuses could play a part. No matter the puzzle pieces that add up to a person snoring, it could be a sign of a bigger issue known as obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA. Now, not every snorer has this condition, even if their snoring is chronic, but OSA can be a serious condition that should be addressed by a medical professional. The structure of a language forces us to attend to certain aspects of language, at the moment of using that language. It's known as the thinking for speaking hypothesis. There's evidence that language involves some kind of image simulation, and that that has a consequence for how we perceive certain events. Color is quite a complex property of a visual world. Your brain is decoding color in quite a complicated way. So you have many languages that have a term to denote both green and blue, and typically we call this a GRU term. You find this in languages like the Himba, for example, in the Namibian plains. In this experiment, we asked participants to look at the color tile, and then after 30 seconds, we show them the full array of colors and we say, now, pick the one that you just saw. And it's a very difficult task if you're an English speaker. But a Himba speaker can do it like child's play because that color is central to them. You simply cannot recognize colors that are not easily encoded in your native language.
Ultimately, the most important thing for learning is not the way the information is presented, but what is happening inside the learner's head. People learn best when they're actively thinking about the material, solving problems, or imagining what happens if different variables change. I talked about how and why we learn best in my video, The Science of Thinking, so check that out. Now, the truth is, there are many evidence-based teaching methods that improve learning. Learning styles is just not one of them. And it is likely, given the prevalence of the learning styles misconception, that it actually makes learning worse. I mean, learning styles give teachers unnecessary things to worry about, and they make some students reluctant to engage with certain types of instruction. And all the time and money spent on learning styles and related training could be better spent on interventions that actually improve learning. You are not a visual learner, nor an auditory learner, nor a kinesthetic learner, or more accurately, you are all these kinds of learner in one. The best learning experiences are those that involve multiple different ways of understanding the same thing. And best of all, this strategy works not just for one subset of people, but for everyone. Too often in marriage, we make sacrifices, and we demand them, without reckoning their cost. But there is wisdom in looking at the price tags attached to our marital decisions in just the way that divorce law teaches us to do. What I want is for people to think about their marital bargains through the lens of divorce. And to ask, how is marriage a sacrifice, but an exchange of sacrifice? How do we think about our exchange? Second, how do we think about childcare and deal with the fact that there is no such thing as free childcare? How do we deal with the fact that some things can be separate and if we don't think about it, then it will all be part of the joint enterprise? So basically, what I want to leave you with is that in marriage or divorce, people should think about the way that till death do us part marriage is forever. Great feedback givers begin their feedback by asking a question that is short but important. It lets the brain know that feedback is actually coming. It would be something, for example, like, do you have five minutes to talk about how that last conversation went, or I have some ideas for how we can improve things. Can I share them with you? This micro yes question does two things for you. First of all, it's going to be a pacing tool. It lets the other person know that feedback is about to be given. And the second thing it does is it creates a moment of buy-in. I can say yes or no to that yes or no question. And with that, I get a feeling of autonomy. The second part of the feedback formula is going to be giving your data point. Here, you should name specifically what you saw or heard, and cut out any words that aren't objective. There's a concept we call blur words. A blur word is something that can mean different things to different people. Blur words are things that are not specific. So for example, if I say you shouldn't be so defensive or you could be more proactive, what we see great feedback givers doing differently is they'll convert their blur words into actual data points. So for example, instead of saying, you know you aren't reliable, we would say, you said you'd get that email to me by 11, 
and I still don't have it yet. Specificity is also important when it comes to positive feedback, and the reason for that is that we want to be able to specify exactly what we want the other person to increase or diminish, and if we stick with blur words, they actually won't have any clue particularly what to do going forward to keep repeating that behavior. Getting back to PTSD, another type of non-declarative memory is emotional memory. Now, this has a specific meaning in psychology and refers to our ability to learn about cues in our environment and their emotional and motivational significance. What do I mean by that? Well, think of a cue like the smell of baking bread, or a more abstract cue like a 20-pound note. Because these cues have been pegged with good things in the past, we like them and we approach them. Other cues, like the buzzing of a wasp, elicit very negative emotions and quite dramatic avoidance behavior in some people. Now, I hate wasps. I can tell you that fact. But what I can't give you are the non-declarative emotional memories for how I react when there's a wasp nearby. I can't give you the racing heart, the sweaty palms, that sense of rising panic. I can describe them to you, but I can't give them to you. Walls and fences are often built with the intention of security, security from another group of people, from crime, from illegal trades. But walls and fences only provide us with a feeling of security, which is different from real security. Even though they might make us feel safe, the structures themselves can't protect us. Instead, they do something else, they separate. They create an us and a them. They establish an enemy. Walls make us build a second wall in our head, a mental wall, and those mental walls slowly make us lose sight of all the things we have in common with the people on the other side. The other way around, mental walls can grow so strong that they encourage us to build, keep, or strengthen physical walls. Physical and mental walls are closely interlinked, and one almost always comes with the other. It's a constant cycle, physical walls empower mental walls, and mental walls empower physical walls until at one point one part falls away, and the cycle is disrupted. Chopsticks are used in a huge portion of the world across much of Asia. About 1.5 billion people are covered in the chopstick sphere. Different cultures have slightly different variations of chopsticks. Chinese chopsticks will tend to be long and round, Korean chopsticks, which are flatter, 
and often made of metal, and Japanese chopsticks tend to be round and very, very pointy. While chopsticks are actually really commonplace in American society today, there was definitely a time in the late 1800s where this idea that Asian men, because they ate rice with sticks, were of a different quality than American men who ate proper meat with knife and fork. But, when China and the United States began their diplomatic engagement in the 1970s, Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger had to practice eating with chopsticks. What's been really interesting to see is that as Asian cuisine has moved from the East into the West, chopsticks have become part of the experience. There's evidence of chopsticks as long ago as the Shang Dynasty, which was about 3,000 years ago. And they loved tripods during the Shang Dynasty. So, when you cook with these big tripods, chopsticks were actually really useful because it was a way for you to stir and reach without getting burned as the water was boiling in these really big pots. Chinese culture has knives and has forks that uses them in many cases for cooking, but in terms of what moved into the dining room, it was the chopstick. Small changes can add up to big shifts in the environment. We know this from decades of research on addictive substances. I understand we really would all like to believe that we're in charge, that we have complete freedom over what we eat. But how free can we be, living in a saturated environment, one that continuously surrounds us with food products carefully engineered to get us hooked and keep us coming back for more? Those kids in the tenderloin, they apparently live in what's called a food desert. They don't even have access to a grocery store, really. What's a grocery store when it's stuffed with junk food, 74% of it loaded with added sugar? All the health experts will tell you, shop around the perimeter of this grocery store, that way you can steer your way around all the junk that's in the middle. But how different is that from a strategy that steers children around drug dealers in the tenderloin? We can do so much better than this. We don't have to live in an environment that is ready to get us fat, and then blame us for the health consequences in the medical bills. We don't have to sit by and watch our children suffer from diseases of adulthood. We can re-rig this environment to make it safe. It's not about personal choice anymore. It's about our public choice. Now let's turn to the second question. Could it be that these psychological consequences of poverty have implications for economic decision-making that make it hard to escape poverty? And there's two ways that you might imagine this could happen. The first is that the stress that's brought on by poverty might affect economic choices in subtle ways. And there's now evidence suggesting that when you're under stress, you're much more impatient than you are when you're not stressed. And that's not a good thing if you're supposed to make long-term decisions and investments in things like healthcare and education. And so unless you, poverty causes stress, stress makes you impatient. And then that impatience doesn't help you to lift yourself out of poverty. But there's a second sense in which the psychological consequences of poverty might exacerbate poverty. And that is that they may simply incapacitate you. So when chronic stress turns into full-fledged clinical depression, 
it's very hard for people to keep earning a living. You don't think your efforts will amount to anything. You know no amount of information about returns to education can convince you otherwise. It's hard for you to even get out of bed in the morning and your livelihood crumbles. So this is bad enough when you're wealthy, but it's worse when you're poor. And you don't have as much of a safety net to fall back on. So as a result of this, there's a silent epidemic of depression among the poor. And that's the problem not only for psychological well-being, but also for economic outcome. What else can we do about noise? Well, very much like a carbon footprint, we all have a noise footprint, and there are things we can do to make that noise footprint smaller. For example, don't start mowing your lawn at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Your neighbors will thank you, or use a rake instead of a leaf blower. In general, noise reduction at the source makes the most sense. So whenever you're looking to buy a new car, air conditioning unit, blender, you name it, make low noise a priority. Many manufacturers will list the noise levels the devices generate, and some even advertise with them. Use that information. Many people think that stronger noise regulation and enforcement are good ideas, even obvious solutions, perhaps. But it's not as easy as you may think, because many of the activities that generate noise also generate revenue. Think about an airport and all the business that is associated with it. Our research tells politicians at what noise level they can expect a certain health effect, and that helps inform better noise policy. Robert Koch supposedly once said, One day, mankind will fight noise as relentlessly as cholera and the pest. I think we are there, and I hope that we will win this fight, and when we do, we can all have a nice, quiet celebration. Fiber is amazing. It affects the digestive tract from top to bottom. It is very simply a carbohydrate the body can't absorb. While other carbs are broken down into sugars, fiber passes by sort of moseying along, doing all kinds of cool things. High-fiber foods physically take longer to eat, so they help us space our meals. The bulk also slows down digestion, especially in the stomach, and makes you feel full longer. Fiber also draws water into the stool, keeping it soft. Scratchy, hard stool is, to put it mildly, unpleasant. It also increases bacterial mass. The water and bacteria together increase the bulk of the stool, which helps it move along. Fiber also slows absorption of sugars into the bloodstream and reduces absorption of fats and cholesterols. And as fiber collects in your colon, it feeds all your good gut bacteria helping you maintain a healthy microbiome. Fiber is associated with the reduced risk of diabetes, heart disease, several gastrointestinal conditions, and even certain cancers.
A person facing real dehydration won't be unsure if they need water. They'll do whatever they need to get it. It's one of our most basic instincts that's evolved over a very long time, in environments where clean water wasn't nearly as readily available as it is today. So thanks to your kidneys, your body is really good at maintaining hydration. But if you stop counting 8 glasses of water a day, how much should you be drinking? The answer is simple, there is no should. When you feel thirsty, drink some water. You can trust your body, unless you have kidney stones or are elderly, sometimes, our messaging systems get a little worn with age, or your doctor has told you otherwise, constantly monitoring how much water you drink is not really necessary. Here's a point that's often missed, every single thing you consume contains water. Your morning coffee has water, so does your breakfast. And that snack, an apple, an orange, a glass of juice, a granola bar, just like you, they're made of water too. So as long as you Motto, we are currently living in a society that is so focused on outwards aesthetics. So I think there is also a driving need for people more interested in things like laser surgery or injectables like Botox or filler from a much, much younger age than we've seen before. Narrator, so despite the lore of magical remedies and luxurious concoctions, avoiding skin damage and combating the signs of aging don't need to be so expensive. Motto, Budget products can be equally as effective as their more expensive counterparts. The focus shouldn't be on the cost of the product. Wearing a good quality sunscreen, SPF minimum 30, ideally 50, throughout the year. The reason for that is that 80% to 90% of the signs that we associate with skin aging occur directly because of sunlight. So we're talking fine lines, wrinkles, pigmentation. Number two is the use of a vitamin-based product or a retinoid. One doesn't need to spend a fortune, and, probably, once you're spending beyond more than 25, 30 pounds on a product, it's probably unnecessary. Joe has written a book called The Experience Economy. Well, what's happened is we've gone from an agrarian economy based off commodities, through an industrial economy based off goods, through a service economy. And today, we're in an experience economy. What experiences really do is that they engage everyone inside of them. Living in the digital age that we are now, there's more need than ever for people to connect. And the digital age also means we can document these experiences and of course, show them off online. We take selfies not because we think we're going to get the perfect picture, but because we were there and it proves that we were there. These are similar to that souvenir that you picked up on your seaside holiday that means absolutely nothing to anybody else but is so important to you. <laughs> 